So first I want to thank you to have for having been invited here to speak in front of you about the very important psychiatric issues in autoimmune diseases. And for about 50 years now, psychiatric uh, comorbidities have gained more scientific interest. So since then, more studies have been done about these themes. Nevertheless, when I researched the literature, I recognized that uh, they don't give the real, the true picture what's going on, but uh, they give an impression uh, about the importance and which influence these comorbidities have on the cause of disease because sample sizes tend to be rather low and especially the design is different and they use different methods to, to describe and especially to assess psychological symptoms and that's a problem. But nevertheless, they give a wonderful impression what's going on. And from a psychiatric point of view, uh, all immune diseases are very interesting because when you have to deal uh, for decades with psychiatric patients, you mainly schizophrenia or bipolar diseases, you will encounter uh, them suffering from other autoimmune diseases too. And you will encounter their family and they will find autoimmune diseases and so on and on. So uh, you have to be familiar as a psychiatrist to, with autoimmune diseases. And I have to press which one? Oh, this the, uh, to go down. I must. You will remember this picture from Professor Marshall's presentation and here you see the comorbidities and uh, the first impression is one autoimmune disease is seldom alone. When you have one, the probability that you will uh, suffer from another one is very great. And when you see uh, on the downside chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome is very difficult. And often physicians just don't, don't believe their patients. So what do they do? They send them to the psychiatrist. And then the psychiatrist is supposed to find a therapy or at least give some comfort that life is just difficult. And you will see depression, and new studies show that, for example, in Europe, about one-third of the population suffers from psychiatric illness, especially depression. So the importance of psychiatry will increase over the time. And you see uh, schizophrenia, and I won't just tell about bipolar diseases, because bipolar diseases are very often very complicated. They have a lifetime prevalence of about 2.4%. Uh, percent, which means about in this moment more than 165 million people are suffering from it and many of them are just not discovered, are not um, diagnosed. So the real number is far more and people with bipolar diseases that suffer from many, many comorbidities, autoimmune comorbidities like for instance diabetes is very often hypothyroiditis, Hashimoto thyroiditis, and like uh, what I've heard uh, the first afternoon, Dr. Meissner from Poland told that SLE patients have a threefold risk to die of a heart attack from cardiovascular disease, and that the same number with bipolar diseases, they have a threefold risk to die from the same uh, diseases, like SLE. And uh, Guillain-Barré is very often, and psoriasis is very often, and uh, the problem with psoriasis in bipolar diseases, the first choice of therapy for bipolar, uh, bipolar disease is still lithium therapy, and lithium can uh, aggravate psoriasis rather in a rather uh, uh, severe state. And I just want to uh, uh, have some sentences about how, uh, how diagnose, how is our psychiatric diagnosis made. It's similar to how immunologists do, immunologists do their diagnosis. They, they just look for a pattern, a special symptom pattern, and then a the conference is done and the specialists decide which patterns they prefer to name a disease. A disease. The same is in psychiatry, you have 
symptom clusters of special symptoms, psychological symptoms, and so you name it, the disease. And nothing with the etiology, just the symptom cluster. So that's the same in psychiatry and in immunology. So, uh, as there are many special diseases, uh, I thought that it doesn't make any sense to uh, stick to uh, symptom clusters, but to special symptoms which are uh, abundant in autoimmune diseases. And one of the main problems in autoimmune diseases is the fatigue. And often when a patient, uh, when a patient suffers from fatigue, it comes to his pulmonologist, for instance, when he's suffering from, or she's suffering from sarcoidosis, and the pulmonologist will say, I can't understand what you are talking about because your oxygen levels are sufficient, so you cannot be fatigued. You have to be good. But Fatigue is uh, often not un well understood from other physicians, so I wanted to cite a patient I met uh, it's, oh, two gate, uh, decades ago, and he was labeled with psycho schizophrenia and intellectual disability. And what did he tell me? I wanted to uh, help him to improve, and then he told me he, he could he had learned a wonderful song with his guitar and on the Christmas time, at the Christmas time I wanted to help him just learn another song. But then he came to me and said, Mrs. Doctor, I know you can if you really want, but sometimes you just cannot want. And that's exactly what fatigue means. You just cannot want. It doesn't matter how much you try because you cannot want. There's just no energy for it. Or I cite from another study, uh, what a patient with uh, extreme fatigue symptom, symptoms told, just the citation, personally, I see fatigue as a greater problem than my quantifiable somatic symptoms and impairments. The fatigue makes me miss out on numerous things where I could learn to live with my somatic disabilities. If the problem of my fatigue were to be solved, I would be able to function normally in society despite my somatic problem. Another very important symptom and disabilitating symptom are depressions, or the symptom of depression, or the state of depression, however you want to tell it. And here I just don't want, I just wanted to give the, the whole picture, just you see all these numbers are very high, very impressive, and depressions are potentially very dangerous diseases for cause the risk of suicide, so early death, especially in young person, is rather increased. And you see the numbers, they are very high, and the first sarcoidosis, there are different numbers, they uh, about a third, and the second 44% uh, was meant with the DSM-4 classification for psychiatric diseases, they found only, uh, only 24% in major depressive disorder, but they found bipolar disorder, panic, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, but all they together were 34%. The first study is from America, and in America, black Americans suffer from very severe cases, especially cutaneous cases, uh, uh, cases concerning the skin, and which is, of course, a marker for outside, for everyone to see how ugly you become, and this make may perhaps uh, increase your feeling of depression. So the first is a study from uh, America, and the second is an Italian study from the University of Siena from Ariana Coracci from 2008. And rheumatic diseases, what you see is the numbers appear low uh, compared to the other diseases, but if compared to the general population, two to three times higher. Sjogren syndrome, again, 32% myasthenia gravis, 33 multiple sclerosis, again, more than 50% uh, suffer from severe depressive symptoms, which can uh, precede the MS diagnosis for many, many years. And SLE is high in systemic sclerosis. I only found studies, the one was from Serbia and the other one from Iran. But there are no sample sizes, but I just wanted to give an expression how often they are. So I told before that there is not the real picture because this study uh, have what I said in before, have low sample size and they all differ in the methods which were used to to uh, to assess these symptoms. 
and I have already mentioned what is the functionality, and so the psychiatry comorbidities increases work disability. Here's a one study on it's mentioned below. below. Uh, when you suffer from severe cases from rheumatoid diseases, uh, you only have a work disability from 25%. When you additionally have a psychiatric comorbidity, the number doubles. And when you are just uh, suffering from mild rheumatoid disease and you you get a psychiatric comorbidity even uh, is threefold from 5 to 70 percent and that's amazing and another is comorbidity the psychiatric comorbidities can kill when you just look at suicidal rates and these are mostly very young people they are more prone to suicide than older ones and the first is chronic fatigue syndrome this is uh, all causes of death about in a time it was a study from 2005 all causes of death in a time uh, about seven years were, were looked at and 20% of these deaths were deaths by suicide and they were younger than all the other ones. Psoriasis, when you look at psoriasis, 9.7% per, uh, wish to be dead and 5.5% have acute suicidal ideation and in multiple sclerosis suicide is even 7.5 higher than in the general population. So this is all very, very severe. And this thought I have is just not new, and it's from Plato. I looked at the book of it's really real. It's from the Charmides or Charmide, I don't know how you pronounce it. The greatest mistake in the treatment of diseases is that there are physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, or they, the two cannot be separated. So that's the impression that we, which we uh, get today, too. But today, we can make studies on other levels. So this is a study. It's a collaboration from, uh, it's a study from 2001. It was a collaboration from the Munich uh, Institute for Max Planck, Munich uh, uh, institution in Munich, and the Hebrew University in uh, Jerusalem. And they made a wonderful study. So what did they do? So it was a double-blind uh, crossover study with 20 healthy male volunteers who completed psychological questionnaires and made neuropsychological tests. One, three, and nine hours are the intravenous injection of salmonella abortus equi, endotoxin, or saline, that was the control group, and blood samples were collected hourly, and the rectal temperature and heart rate were monitored continually. But what I want to show you, I, not, I'm not sure if you can see it. After two hours, the anxiety levels increased. And the depression levels, in the middle, they increased uh, later on. And memory functions, the different kind of memories, they decreased. But you activate your immune system, and what happens, rather immediately, you become anxious. These are healthy persons. And your, your state, your depression, depression means you, you become slow, you feel depressed, you feel tired, and your memory functions decrease. So what is necessary? You need to change your behavior. And this is what I just came up with. Uh, the illusion point is the immune system fights infection by activating cytokine cascade and by modifying emotions, memory, and behavior. And so while killing infected agents, we become tired and weak, that is the sickness behavior. But to survive this sickness behavior, we have to change our behavior. We need to hide and seek protection and care to survive. So anxiety is helpful, evolutionary point of view, because it makes us change our behavior to survive. And this, that um, cytokines, that the immune system change behavior, and protects though is even well when you think uh, when you see ill people and uh, in animals even more when they smell illness they can smell illness they just avoid the contact so they change their behavior and we know when the smell differs how our reactions are always we can measure a different cytokine patterns so it's very interesting
So what I wanted to tell is, so this is a picture from Bonnie Basler from Princeton University. It's taken from a TED talk. It gives the relation between bacterial uh, uh, cells and human cells and bacterial DNA at 1 to 10, left side, and 1 to 100. This means uh, what happens to this little man with 1 to 100 because uh, when you will suppress the immune system, the immune system has to fight so many problems, and when you suppress the immune system, what will happen with man, he will you know, just change. And this is Paul Ehrlich. He created the name, the horror autotoxical, when he said, horror autotoxical is when the immune system, which is very, very uh, uh, potent, attacks itself. And uh, the question is, is this uh, compatible, this imagination, the model of autoimmune disease that the body, the immune system attacks the body, is this compatible with the uh, concept of evolution we have today? I think it's not compatible, but I think we have to think about our models for chronic diseases. And the question is to suppress or not suppress the immune system, and that is the question. So I have just what Trevor Marshall said with the Marshall Protocol to activate the immune system with all the sarcom to activate the uh, VDR receptor. He was just a person with uh, sarcoidosis, which suffered, he was retired, and after some time on the Marshall Protocol to activate the VDR with all the sarcom, she came back to work full time after some years. <coughs> and in this age, it's very, very in. Uh, Probably it was rather unprobable before, but it's just amazing to see this. Another case is multiple sclerosis. She suffered years before the diagnosis was seen. She suffered from fatigue, uh, uh, nervous opticus, neuritis, and fatigue. And after a short time, especially the psychotic comorbidities uh, uh, became normal again. And this is the translation approach we need today. So regarding this Marshall Protocol, just activating the VDR means there's evidence it has been given that immune stimulation by activating VDR improves autoimmune diseases with the comorbidity. So or especially the psychiatric comorbidities, they were solved uh, early on in the treatment call. And it's based on a comprehensive disease model which was uh, already explained by Trevor Marshall. And what I've learned today this morning, I just stole these sentences from Mr. Kaveri. It obviously normalizes and restores immune repertoire and is stole from Mr. Schoenfeld. It harnesses the innate immune system, but this is what it obviously does. And the MP offers a rather safe and affordable therapy for chronic diseases with otherwise overwhelmed every health system and society because of increasing numbers and costs in an aging population. And what we need is well-designed clinical studies are needed to improve this therapy, which additionally offer the chance to gain more insight in how uh, the human immune system works on cellular and molecular level. And so collaboration between different medical specialities and basic scientists, what's meant with translational code, is needed to this chance to learn more about the human immune system, about the human health and TDs. So I hope I was quick enough. These are the literature references, and thank you, and take care.